It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you and uh, good morning, Speaker, to the Premier. PC Leader Doug Ford and the entire Ontario PC family were all moved by the events of yesterday. Our thoughts are with the victims, the families, and those affected at Young and Finch here in Toronto. We want to thank the brave first responders. Speaker, we want to thank the brave first responders and the EMS teams who continue to work tirelessly on our behalf. Mr. Speaker, would the Premier like to share her sentiments with the House? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know that uh, everyone in this House uh, joins with the families and the victims, families of the victims, friends of the victims, um, and all of the people who are affected by this, and as I would say, Mr. Speaker, we all are. Um, let me just read the update that I, uh, that I gave to the, uh, the media this morning. Um, I said this morning, Mr. Speaker, that as the city wakes up, there are families, a family and friends of this horrible tragedy and the victims themselves who have survived whose lives will never be the same. Our hearts reach out to them, and we desperately want to give them some comfort. As Mayor Tory said last night, that desire to comfort can perhaps help us all in Toronto and beyond to be a bit kinder, a bit more gentle with each other today and in the days to come. In my role as Premier, it is my responsibility to ensure that any provincial resources that are needed to cope with the ongoing investigation and security measures, that they are available. And I want to report to Torontonians and Ontarians that that is happening. I was briefed again first thing this morning. Our provincial security officials continue to work hand-in-hand -hand with federal and municipal officials. The OPP is in constant touch with the RCMP and the Toronto Police Service officials who are involved and, and who are involved in uh, the ongoing investigation. The, uh, the people who are involved in the identification of victims put extra teams on duty last night to move that processing along to help families get information sooner and to help ease those painful hours of waiting. I spent the afternoon yesterday with Mayor Tory in North York. I have nothing but the deepest admiration for the Toronto police officers, firefighters, paramedics who responded so quickly. They responded so professionally, so compassionately to the tragedy that unfolded. These are brave, highly skilled men and women who desire our heartfelt thanks. I also had the opportunity to spend some time last night at Sunnybrook Hospital, the hospital that received the largest number of victims. Again, we want to thank every one of the paramedics, the nurses, the doctors, and all of the health personnel who responded so professionally and so well. CEO Andy Smith emphasized the sad reality that his team is prepared for a situation like this because they practice and train for such a day, hoping it will never come. But when it did, and calls were made to off-duty nurses and personnel to, come in, personnel to come in, they were already on their way. They knew exactly what had to happen. So thank you to each of the professionals, each of the neighbours and passers-by who helped an injured person. Thank you to each and every person who lent a hand. I heard a question on radio this morning about whether our city, our province, our country will be changed because of this senseless act of violence. The lives of the families and friends of the victims are changed forever. But our collective job now is to find a way to grieve, to acknowledge that pain and stand with those who have lost so much, and then to make sure that the life of this vibrant, good city and province goes on. We are capable of deep compassion and understanding in Toronto, in Ontario, and in Canada, and we will be called upon to summon all of that in the days ahead. Given the unique circumstances, it is my uh, decision that when the third party comes for their 
first question I will allocate, uh, give some time for them to make a comment as well, and I would come back to the, minute, to the uh, leader to offer him an opportunity, if he cho so chooses, to say a few words, and then we'll move into question period as we have to. <laughs> leader. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, I think we've, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Premier for that update. I think that was a uh, thorough and respectful update. Uh, we uh, genuinely appreciate the work of the first responders and the EMS teams that are out there. There are many questions that will be answered over the coming days, and we look forward, the Premier, to uh, continued updates uh, as, uh, as the province and as the uh, uh, municipality learns them. And so our thoughts, our hearts ache for the families and for the victim speaker. Thank you. The uh, House Leader of the Third Party. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, these type of things are never things that we think are going to happen in our backyard. But unfortunately, we do find out that we live in a world, and the world, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, things uh, f unfold in ways that are not pleasant for many who are directly affected in it and, and not affected directly. I think there's a couple of things, and the Premier, I think, summed it up well, is that our police forces and the way that they acted yesterday makes us all proud that the reaction was in order to calm the situation down and to do what was right when it was coming to apprehend the individual. Uh, and I think we can all be proud of that because I think it speaks volumes to the training that we do to our police, to the ambulance people, to the, uh, to the paramedics, to uh, the fire department and everybody else who showed up. Again, kudos. I think the Premier summed it up quite well, along with the, uh, the leader of the uh, Conservative Party uh, here in the Legislature. Uh, they acted totally professionally. But the other thing that I think we are all impressed with is how the public reacted. Those people that were there on the sidewalk, those people that were there on the streets, they were there doing what they could in order to be able to make things better and to try to administer first aid. In fact, a good friend of mine, David Sword, happened to be on site when it happened. I found out after. We haven't talked about it yet uh, because he's still uh, going through probably some of that trauma. But I want to let you know that Andrew Horvath and you Democrats uh, stand tall and proud with our uh, police forces, uh, forces and emergency services and what they've done and with the citizens of this province. Uh, Andrea is actually on site there this morning. I uh, thought she would go and uh, pay respects uh, directly on site. So uh, our uh, party, along with our leader, our congratulations go out to those, who were, uh, those that were on site. And we grieve for the families, quite frankly, that have been so so devastated by what happened yesterday. Thank you. I appreciate all the comments and your latitude for, to allow me to, uh, to make sure that we all have a uh, word to say. Uh, I will now then return to the Leader of the Opposition for his supplementary question and recognize that this place is unique and we need to ask some questions of the government and that will take place. Supplementary. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Speaker. I'll now speak in my role as the uh, interim leader of the official opposition and continue our duties in that, uh, in that respect. So back to the Premier. Uh, Premier, Ontario ratepayers and taxpayers want answers. Mr. Speaker, when did the Premier become aware that Hydro One gave their CEO a $6 million salary and a $10 million severance? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and to respond to the question put by the, um, the uh, leader within the House um, from the Conservatives. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, when it comes to the executive salaries at Hydro One, um, we recognize that these are high compared to the vast majority of Ontario salaries, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to remain committed to um, work with Hydro One on their regulation accountability and, and their transparency, Mr. Speaker, through our government's involvement as a, as a majority shareholder, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And, and I know, um, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to 
um, work with uh, Hydra One because, Mr. Speaker, we have seen a change in that company. Um, the executive team has found $114 million in savings, Mr. Speaker. Answer. They um, entered, uh, you know, a voluntary winter disconnection program before we had, as a house, had to implement that. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll, we'll continue you. to to monitor. Thank you. Final supplement. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier approve of both the Hydro One? CEO's $6 million salary and his $10 million severance. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when it comes to uh, costs, Mr. Speaker, um, the board, um, the Ontario Energy Board, that is, Mr. Speaker, they, they set rates. So by talking about firing the CEO, of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't take anything off of anyone's bills. So the board, Mr. Speaker, is the energy sector's independent regulator with a mandate to protect ratepayers, um, and that's how it's going to continue to deliver on that mandate. Um, for instance, Mr. Speaker, last um, last fall, the Ontario Energy Board capped the portion of executive compensation Hydro One Electricity customers are required to fund at 10 percent of base salaries, saving ratepayers $30 million over this year and next, Mr. Answer. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board will continue to monitor, will continue to work with Hydro One to help them become a better company, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final. Uh New question, sorry. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. In speaking about the Auditor General's comments on the Liberal Hydro scheme, the Minister of Energy had the following to say, quote, Our plan has been approved by her peers at some of Canada's top accounting firms, KPMG, e &Y, and Deloitte. The Auditor General has said that's not true. Mr. Speaker, did the accounting firms mentioned approve the plan? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, so what we have here are two world-class accounting firms, um, and I will outline what they had to say in statements about rate-regulated accounting within the public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. So KPMG said, on the basis of our ex extensive research, deliberations, and an opinion from another major accounting firm, we believe that the accounting policies adopted by the independent electricity system operator are in accordance with the Canadian public sector accounting standards. Clear. Deloitte, Mr. Speaker, they stated, concluded that any regulatory assets and liabilities recognized through the appropriate application of these policies would meet the criteria for recognition under the Canadian public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. Additionally, Ernst & Young Answer. is OPG's financial auditor and is consulted on this, Mr. Speaker, on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Energy. It's interesting he uses those phrases which have nothing to do what we're, uh, with, 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 with what we're talking about, Speaker. In regards to KPMG, Ernst & Young and Deloitte, the Auditor General has said, quote, the sum of all the work the Minister was just speaking about does not equate to approval of the accounting of the hydro scheme. So, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, is the Auditor General correct? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, um, I don't believe I need to reiterate and reread re -read what um, the accounting firms have said, because I know the honourable member had just heard those, Mr. Speaker, but they do talk about, and I, I will say again, as KPMG said, um, these policies, these accounting policies, are in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. Deloitte, meet the criteria for recognition under the Canadian public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. And I, and, and I know, Mr. Speaker, we've said this before, and I'll say it again. It was a policy choice made by this government. We made this policy choice to ensure that we continue to have a clean, reliable, and an affordable electricity system for the ratepayers of today and the ratepayers tomorrow. Because, Mr. Speaker, 
The Fair Hydro Plan Answer. keeps the cost of borrowing within the rate base, not on the tax base, because that's the logical thing to do, Mr. Speaker, and how it's been done in the Thank past. You. Final supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Energy. The minister has said, quote, of course we've worked with KPMG, we've worked with Ernst & Young, we've worked with Deloitte. Quote, all of them agree that the accounting standards are accurate, except, Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General has said that's not true. They didn't approve the books. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Energy come clean? I'll reiterate once again, Mr. Speaker. Here's what KPMG said, Mr. Speaker, in a public statement that on their basis of extensive research, deliberations, and the opinion from another major accounting firm, KPMG stated, we believe that the accounting policies adopted by the independent electricity system operator are in accordance with the Canadian public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. And the policies and the implementation of this process for the Fair Hydro Plan were designed, Mr. Speaker, and extensively reviewed by senior bureaucratic officials from my ministry, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Finance, the Treasury Board Secretariat, the Office of the Provincial Controller, Cabinet Office, Mr. Speaker, Answer. the Ontario Financial Authority, the ISO, OPG, and we work with those third-party executives, uh, accounting firms, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to look at and monitor and implementation options Thank to you. ensure that due diligence was completed, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I want to start by saying I regret that I wasn't here to hear the comments from the Premier and from the um, parliamentary leader of the official opposition, nor my colleague, Gilles Bisson. I was at the memorial at uh, Young Street in Finch, and I just want to say that uh, um, it was a very emotional scene, and uh, all I can say to everyone here is uh, I believe that together we need to mourn, and we need to seek justice, and then we need to help each other heal. So that's, um, that's all I can say, Speaker. Um, I'm going to start my question by asking the Premier this. Um, the Premier has underfunded hospitals every single year she's been in that office, and I want to ask if she's surprised that after years of underfunding uh, that it's created such a crisis uh, in hallway medicine in our province. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I, um, I appreciate that the leader of the third party was at the uh, <clears throat> was at the memorial. I'll be heading up uh, shortly, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> but she uh, she wasn't here when I said uh, how excellent how excellent Missed the that. service in uh, in our hospitals is, Mr. Speaker. And I I was speaking about the response of the doctors and the nurses and all of the personnel uh, at Sunnybrook, Mr. Speaker, specifically. But I can speak for hospitals across this province that have have responded to needs in their communities, Mr. Speaker, year after year, month after month, and we have supported them, Mr. Speaker. We have worked with them. We have increased the number of nurses, increased the number of doctors, increased the funding, and we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that there is more to be done, which is why, on top of the $500 million Answer. in last year's budget, there's $822 million that will go directly to hospitals, Mr. Speaker. Right well, Speaker, after 15 years, Ontario has the fewest number of hospital beds per capita in the entire country. Since 2015, the Premier has fired 1,600 nurses. As bad as it is, Doug Ford says that he would cut 4 per cent from everything. That would mean 32,000 nurses over four Shame. years. If firing 1,600 nurses means that, this, uh, means that this crisis has occurred, imagine how bad hospital overcrowding would be with Doug Ford firing 32,000 nurses. Oh, right. Will the Premier admit, finally, that she has created this crisis? Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I, I assume that underlying the question from the leader of the third party is that she doesn't believe that our health care system functions well. Yeah. She doesn't believe, yeah. Mr. Speaker, that when people go to a hospital or they go to a doctor or a nurse practitioner to a clinic or they go to a community health centre, um, of which we have built dozens across the province, Mr. Speaker, that she doesn't believe that people get good care. And I would say to the leader of the third party, that is absolutely not true. People in this province know that they can count on their health care system, Mr. Speaker. They know that their hospital, their their 
clinic led by a nurse practitioner, their community health centre, Mr. Speaker. They know that they are going to provide, ex they are going to receive excellent, excellent care, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. They know that because we have supported the health care system, and we will continue to do that, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. What the Premier forgot to talk about is hallway medicine, Speaker, the crisis that she's created in our hospitals. That's the concern the New Democrats are talking about. You know, the good news is people don't have to choose between the Liberals who created this crisis by underfunding health care and the Conservatives who would make it worse by cutting even further and privatizing our health care system. A premier, uh, as Premier, I will fund hospitals properly. Speaker, I've made that commitment. We will end hallway medicine. New Democrats have made that commitment. Why can't the Premier admit that the Liberal government is responsible for Ontario's crisis in hallway medicine? Why can't she just admit it? Everyone can see it, Speaker. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the Premier has said, we have continued our investments every year. I want to address the issue of nurses uh, in our health care system because uh, the leader of a third party did refer to some uh, imaginary cuts uh, in this regard. Since our government took office in 2003, more than 30,000 nurses have begun work in Ontario. That wow. is a 27 percent increase. Even just so recently, there are 1,200 more nurses employed in Ontario compared to last year. These are substantial increases year over facts. year. And in fact, there are almost 10,000 more nurses working since 2013. These wow. are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We're increasing our uh, wonderful, excellent nursing staff, uh, as well as so many of the components Thank in you. our health care system. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My next question is uh, also to the Premier. Hallway medicine has reached such a crisis that London Health Sciences has had to develop a new, quote, hallway transfer protocol. A hallway transfer protocol. The Vice President of London Health Sciences says theirs, quote, is not the only hospital affected by gridlock. We're seeing more and more of this because our system is stretched from a capacity perspective, end quote. Now, is the Premier still denying that there is a hallway medicine crisis in the province of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to deny that there is a need for uh, continued and increased funding, Mr. Speaker, in our health care system. There is an aging demographic, Mr. Speaker, particularly in areas of growth. There are real concerns about, uh, about uh, the need for more support, which is exactly why we're investing another, an additional $822 million in, uh, in hospitals directly, Mr. Speaker. That's a, an overall 4.6 percent increase, and that's in addition to the 3.2 percent increase that we put in place last year, Mr. Speaker. It will increase capacity, it will decrease wait times, it will improve access to care for families uh, in Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, we are investing in home care. We are investing in mental health, Mr. Speaker. We are expanding OHIP Plus to cover seniors, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we recognize that there has been a transformation in health care, that people want care at home, which is why we have been investing in home care. We will Thank continue you. to do that as well as invest in hospitals. Well, Speaker, there was a real need for funding and a real need for support for the 10 years that this Premier froze budgets or increased them below the inflationary levels. There was need for it then, too, Speaker. For years, the NDP has been telling the stories of everyday people who have found themselves in a hospital hallway or a bathroom, Speaker, or a lounge room or TV room. The staff do their very, very best, Speaker, but the lights are always on in those places. People have no privacies, privacy, and the resources that they need are simply not there. In London, it won't just be hallways. The new protocol will see people put anywhere that isn't in front of an exit, a stairwell, or near a hazardous item. Question. This is Ontario in 2018. Yeah. 
Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. I'll take care of it. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation is named. Minister of the Environment and Ener in, uh, Climate Change is warned. The leader may finish her question. Is the Premier still denying that there is a crisis in hallway medicine in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I think, uh, I think it's clear that feelings are running high today, and I think we all uh, can acknowledge that. And, Mr. Speaker, I'll just say again to the leader of the third party that we have consistently increased funding to hospitals. We have also, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, year over year, increased funding to home care, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and yeah. to other parts of the health care system that need to be in place because people are asking for uh, care in different ways, Mr. Speaker. I think that what uh, what the Minister of uh, Indigenous Relations was responding to, Mr. Speaker, was at a time when we know that our health care professionals are among the best in the world. We Answer. all need to be supporting them. We need to be uh, recognizing them for the excellent, excellent professionals that they are, Mr. That's Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. <clears throat> Speaker, four years of freezes, zero increases. That's exactly what this Premier did. And she can paint it in any term she wants, but the facts are the case. A zero increase doesn't mean that they increase the hospital budgets. It means that they froze them for four years, Speaker. Doug Ford said he'll privatize everywhere including in our health care system. The Conservatives would cut and privatize, and the Liberals have given us the hallway medicine crisis that we have right now, so we can't trust them to fix it. But there is hope on the way because I have a plan to fix hallway medicine, to provide hospitals with stable funding that will end the crisis and add 2,000 beds immediately. Why can't this Premier just admit, admit that she's created a hallway medicine crisis in the province of Ontario? Okay. Mr. Speaker, first of all, first of all, the uh, the allegation that the leader of the third party is making is just not true, Mr. Speaker. We have increased funding to hospitals year over year, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that there is a need for an increased investment. That's why there's a 4.6%. Uh, increase in our budget, Mr. Speaker, $822 million. But I would say to the leader of the third party that as the Premier of this province, as the government, it is our responsibility to look at the entire health care system, Mr. Speaker, to look at all of the different parts of the health care system and to make sure that we respond to the, ev the evolution of people's needs in the province, Mr. Speaker. We have an aging demographic. People have said we want to be at home, we want more home care, we want health care delivered sir. differently. That is what we have done, Mr. Speaker, as we have continued to hire more nurses, more doctors, and increase funding to hospitals, Mr. Thank Speaker. My question for the Premier. Speaker, it's been a month and a half since the Premier spoke briefly with opponents of the ED19 mega dump in my riding. Media reported that she would uh, speak to me and get my views in the dump, which is actually quite strange because uh, I've been very clear no mega dump should uh, be built in my riding with 20 year old approvals. She has not heard her commitment, but uh, I just got one question for her today. Does she agree with me, the area residents? the Township of Edwardsburg Cardinal, uh, the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne Grand Chief Benedict, that it's wrong to open a mega dump with 20-year-old environmental approvals? Yes or no? Good question. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Sure, the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you for the important question about, uh, about the dump. And I know, uh, I know this is a very uh, a very sensitive, uh, a very sensitive issue. Um, and I understand that uh, 
that where dumps are placed, how dumps are located, how big they are, uh, can be uh, very sensitive. You know, no one, uh, granted, no one is happy if uh, they're having a dump placed uh, in their community. Uh, but I will say, Speaker, that we, we do take the placement of these dumps quite seriously, the landfills quite seriously, and we go through a very rigorous monitoring and evaluation process before permissions are given around any of, uh, uh, any of these landfill sites. And, Speaker, uh, I'll speak more about other efforts that this government is making to deal with waste. Excellent. Supplementary. Um, speaker, I, I can't, this is the same minister, Speaker, who mocked my constituents' legitimate concerns by telling me in this House that one person's garbage is another person's treasure. I can assure you, Minister, that this garbage is no treasure to those forced to live with it. When the Premier was in my riding, she told opponents that they have a compelling argument. No kidding. Her own Ministry of Environment and Climate Change says no dump in Ontario has ever opened with such stale dated permits. They told me that dumps usually proceed within one to eight years of getting a permit. ED-19s have been sitting on the shelf for over 20 years, Speaker. Finally, my question, will you join me today question. and take a stand and pledge that no mega dump will go on this site without a full environmental assessment, yep. consultation with the Mohawks of Aquasosne, and a willing Thank host you. declaration here, here. from Township Council? Well, Speaker, I think the, uh, I think the member opposite uh, um, needs to understand a little bit more about uh, uh, the government's uh, Circular Economy Act, about our, our waste-free uh, Ontario Act, quite frankly. But I won't talk about uh, that right now. I will say uh, that ED19, uh, it remains valid under a number of conditions, only if the proposed landfill is to be constructed uh, as it was originally cited and designed. Uh, and. Uh, while the current environmental assessments and uh, compliance approvals are still valid, the ministry speaker is going to require a new assessment if changes are made to the project in regards to expansion, monitoring, or leachate collection uh, under the uh, under the Environmental uh, Assessment Act. Speaker, the uh, the ministry requires a new assessment of the county's proposed an expansion of the service area of that project. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the acting premier. Recently, we learned how five tenants living at 795 College Street in Toronto were forced from their apartments so the landlord could complete renovations. The landlord ignored the tenant's right to reoccupy the units after the renovations were completed and instead rented the apartments out to new tenants at three times the rent. Whoa. It's called a renoviction. Last year, the Premier had an opportunity to support NDP amendments to Bill 124 that would have closed loopholes that allow unethical landlords to use renovictions to force out tenants so they can jack up the rent. Why didn't the Premier support these amendments? Thank you. Mr. Of Housing. Speaker. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Toronto Danforth for the question. Uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, our government made substantial changes to expand rent control to all Ontario tenants. Sure. Previously, about a quarter million Ontario tenants did not enjoy the protection of rent control. We brought that change in. As part of our fair housing uh, plan, Mr. Speaker, we wanted to make sure that tenants receive the protection that they require. We expanded the rent control system. We recently brought in uh, the standard lease, which takes effect as of uh, April 30th, uh, in a few days' time, and that will also be, give more protection to all Ontario tenants and make it clear what landlords' obligations are and what tenants' rights are. And I'm happy to address uh, more of uh, uh, this issue Answer. in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you didn't protect these tenants. Speaker, 
back to the acting premier. Landlords are still using pressure tactics to push tenants out so they can raise the rent to whatever level they want. In February, tenants in Parkdale claimed that their landlord neglected basic repairs, but then installed upscale amenities that the low-income tenants were supposed to pay for with above-guideline increases. These tenants were basically being forced to either finance the gentrification of their own units or face rent eviction. Instead, they decided to go on a rent strike. Why must tenants go on a rent strike to keep their homes safe, properly maintained, and affordable? Why? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm not able to speak to specific uh, cases which might be before the Landlord-Tenant Tribunal, but, Mr. Speaker, we do have a strong Residential Tenancies Act that does have enforcement measures when a landlord breaks the law. And I know in uh, some of these cases, the Rental Enforcement Unit of the Ministry of Housing is investigating, and if there are charges uh, that are warranted, they would be late following a proper investigation, Mr. Speaker. If a landlord attempts to uh, have uh, expenses put on an above-the-guideline increase, the Landlord-Tenant uh, Tribunal can stop that, can mandate that only proper expenses uh, are passed on to tenants. And where there's a situation where a landlord tries to illegally Answer. evict tenants, there are remedies to protect tenants, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the Minister of Finance. Many people in this province rely on natural gas to heat their homes and run their major appliances. When the Liberals and NDP brought in the cap and trade carbon tax, they made life expensive for millions of people in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, the cost of cap and trade on natural gas bills was on average an extra $80.50 per year. But shockingly, Mr. Speaker, in 2020, according to the long term forecast commissioned by the Ontario Energy Board, it could cost an extra $336 per year. Mr. Speaker, that's an increase of 317%. Speaker, how much is this Liberal government, government prepared to make families pay for natural gas? Thank you. Acting Premier. Oh, sorry, Minister, Minister of Finance. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. I will use a supplementary to one of my colleagues. But let's be clear. We're talking about a cap and trade system, a wholesale product that is enabling us to provide up to two billion dollars more to reinvest in new economies and a new green energy program that enables us to build our economy and, in, and increase our GDP. And furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we are. As you could tell, I'm in the mood. So I'm going to see if. And I'll use it. Finish, Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we're now increasing natural gas into those communities that do not have that opportunity. And that only happens because we do have a program in place to enable those capital infrastructure programs that the opposition would vote against, Mr. Speaker. They're cutting back on the things that matter to Ontarians, including the expansion of natural gas to all communities across the province. And furthermore, a new economy Answer. and greater growth in our in our province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Finance. When the Liberals and NDPs brought in the cap and trade carbon tax, they knew it was going to hit families where it hurt, from keeping their car on the road to keeping their home heated through winter. It makes everything in the province more expensive. Not only is the cap and trade carbon tax hidden on natural gas bills, it also has HST on top of it. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, is this government willing to hike the carbon tax on natural gas from $80.50 per year to $336 per year? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and pleased to rise and, and talk about um, uh, cap and trade, Mr. Speaker, and of course um, the decision that was talked about earlier for us um, when we, we talked about uh, consumers' bills, Mr. Speaker. So, cap and trade, Mr. Speaker, and the decision on how to present that on consumers' bill, bills was made by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker, and that's an independent arm's length regulator for the province's energy sector. And it did so, Mr. Speaker, based off of extensive consultations with consumers, utilities and environmental stakeholders, including over 40 written submissions. Member from Leeds, uh, sorry, the member from Prince Edward Hastings, you are trying to hide behind him and you were behaving yourself, I will admit that. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In their decision, the Ontario Energy Board highlighted that cap-and-trade costs are part of doing the business of delivering natural gas yes, to homes and businesses, Mr. Speaker. And to quote the board in the OEP's view, separating out cap-and-trade related costs as a line item on the bill is, is inconsistent with the manner Thank in you. which all other ongoing costs are operating the utility are reflected on the Thank you. New question to the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The Caesars-Windsor Casino labour dispute is nearly three weeks long. 2,300 workers, members of Unifor Local 444, are ready to negotiate. They've been ready since day one. Yep. But it takes two to bargain, Speaker, and Caesars management hasn't shown they are willing or, or anything but a willing partner in this negotiation process. In fact, they just cancelled all programming at the, ca at the casino today up until May 19th. Sure. This isn't just any business. Speaker, casinos in Ontario operate in partnership with the OLG, a division of this Liberal government. Yep. These 2,300 workers make the hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue that the casino takes in possible. They deserve respect and a partner in the negotiation process, yep. not someone that won't engage in bargaining. Speaker, will the Premier direct Caesars management to live up to its responsibilities Question. and get back to the bargaining table? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for their question about Windsor's, uh, the, uh, the Caesar strike, Speaker. Province of Ontario, I've said this over and over again, we've got one of the best dispute resolution records, Speaker, in North America. Yes. When people are collectively bargaining in this province, in about 98 per cent of the cases, Speaker, we reach a collective agreement without having to resort to a strike, to a lockout, Speaker, and that's something we should be proud of. A member from Kitchener-Waterloo is warned. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. Currently in Caesars, we've got just over 2,000 employees, Speaker. They're a member of uh, Unifor 444. They've been on strike, Speaker, since April the 6th. At the time of the strike deadline, they did reach a tentative agreement, Speaker. It was not ratified by the members. I'll follow up in the supplementary, Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Right, Ryder, the Minister of Labour, it actually takes two parties at the bargaining table, and Caesars is not bargaining. Nobody's asking the Premier to interfere with collective bargaining. We are asking her to make sure that management at Caesars Windsor comes to the table in good faith. That's all. That's Caesars Windsor management hasn't even reached out to Unifor to schedule dates. They are not willing to talk to the frontline workers who provide the services that make Caesars Windsor profitable in the first place. The Premier needs to know that losses to Windsor's economy are estimated yeah. to be in the millions and climbing. Speaker, workers can't bargain with themselves. They need a partner who is also committed to reaching a fair deal. Right. Caesar's unwillingness to come to the table <laughs> isn't just on them. It's on the Premier Question. because she's responsible for OLG and all government-owned casinos. When will the Premier do the right thing and make sure that Caesar's management gets back to bargaining? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the supplementary, Speaker. In this case, as I said, we have an excellent record of dispute resolution in this province, some of the best arbitrators in the country, some of the best mediators in the country, and we bring them into situations like this, Speaker. We offer them to the parties. In this case, an agreement was reached at the table, Speaker. Mm -hmm. The agreement was sent to the membership. The membership did not ratify it, Speaker. As a result of that, on April the 18th, we had our mediators back into the situation, Speaker. I agree with the member. It's a responsibility of the employer 
and the union to make every effort to resolve their differences at the bargaining table, Speaker. I don't know how the member is asking me as a Minister of Labour to interfere in this dispute, Speaker. We don't do that. We provide assistance. The best deal, yes, Speaker, sir. are those that are reached at the bargaining table. We urge both sides to return to the table and strike a deal, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Lancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, uh, Westdale. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Housing. Speaker, in our 2017 budget, this government committed to creating more fairness across Ontario. Part of that commitment was the introduction of the basic income pilot. This pilot aims, aims to determine how a basic income can expand opportunities and job prospects while providing greater security for people living on low incomes. The pilot was launched in four sites, including my home riding of Hamilton, and studies <clears throat> both a randomized control trial and a saturation trial. I've been happy to see the early and positive uh, results. Our innovative basic income pilot is also receiving international recognition. The basic income pilot was recently chosen as a finalist for Fast Company's annual Best Changing Ideas Award. Could the minister please update the House on the status of the basic income program? Great, great thank you, Minister of Housing. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. and I want to thank the member for the question and his lifelong advocacy for social justice. So, Mr. Speaker, on the first anniversary of launching the Basic Income Pilot, I'm pleased to announce that it is fully subscribed. Wow. 4,000 people are now receiving payments from the three-year pilot. 2,000 people have been placed in the control group, which provide the pilot's evaluators uh, with crucial data on vital outcomes. Participants in the study are telling us already how it's transforming their lives, being able to pay the rent, buy groceries, buy new clothes, and helping them get back to school. It's helping them turn their lives around. Ontario's basic income pilot is part of the government's uh, plan to build everyone up in this province, whether it's increasing the minimum wage, providing more housing, Medicare, or other health. It's important that we support our people. The BI is showing that our government invests in care as opposed to a government that would cut benefits yes, for sir. Ontarians and call it efficiency. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. <clears throat> Speaker, I know that my constituents uh, in Hamilton and the surrounding region enrolled in the project are already beginning to see the difference that a basic income is making on their lives. Alana is from Hamilton and is on the pilot. She and several other participants are in the legislature today to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the launch of this government's basic income pilot. This group and many others are preparing to share their basic income experiences at the upcoming North American Basic Income Congress to be held in my beloved Hamilton this May. We're looking forward to hearing their stories and perspectives. Speaker, I'm proud on this side of the House that we continue to look for innovative ways to support low-income Ontarians. Question. Can the minister please tell this House what the next steps are for the basic income program? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for the question and also uh, welcome the advocates and supporters that are here today joining us in the legislature. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to evaluate and test uh, how the basic income uh, can support vulnerable workers, improve health education, and housing outcomes for people uh, on low income. However, Mr. Speaker, our government understands that more needs to be done to support all low-income Ontarians. And that's why, in our 2018 budget, our government announced historic investments to social services. Mr. Speaker, $2.3 billion over the next three years will increase social assistance rates, change earning exemptions, and eliminate ineffective rules. I'm finally happy that the NDP has uh, a plan to Answer. invest in social assistance, but the real threat to social assistance in the province of Ontario is the Conservatives, who in the last administration you. cut social assistance by 22 percent. Thank you. New question, the member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. 
Currently, only the Ministry of Environment is required to approve the location of a landfill. Municipalities aren't given a say, despite the significant impact landfills have on their communities. From Matisse Valcote to Sarnia, councils are passing resolutions demanding the right to have authority over landfills. Does the Minister of Municipal Affairs believe that municipalities should have the authority over actions taken in their community? Thank you. Minister of Municipalities. Speaker of the Environment and Climate Change, Speaker. Speaker of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thanks, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, his advocacy around this issue. You know, and we are we're taking his bill under under careful review. Um, our first priority is, Speaker, to keep waste out of landfill um, through uh, existing waste diversion efforts. We're keeping approximately three million tons of waste out of landfills every year. And through our Waste Free Ontario Act, Speaker, uh, which I regret to say the member opposite uh, voted against, we're committed to doing even more. Uh, our new model is going to shift more of the burden of reducing and reusing waste to producers. Uh, we expect this shift is going to save municipalities across Ontario about $120 million a year. Um, still, Speaker, we recognize that, uh, that we have to have solutions in place for waste that can't be diverted. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. I recently introduced the Bill 16, Respecting Municipal Authority Over Landfill. It's an act to give municipalities the respect they deserve and give them a say over the location of landfills and ensure that they are willing hosts. Mr. Speaker, it's about respecting municipal authority in their communities. Will the minister support my bill giving municipalities the authority and to have a say, or will he continue to deny him that right? And I'd like the Minister of Municipal Affairs to answer the question, as this is a municipal issue. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. You know, and I'm, I, uh, I, I seem to recall from my time on a municipal council that there's nothing in the act that prevents a municipality around this issue right now. Uh, but I will leave that uh, to, uh, to uh, the member opposite to, uh, to debate. You know, I can tell you, though, Speaker, from this portfolio, the Ministry of uh, Environment and Climate Change, any decision regarding a landfill requires independent, nonpartisan uh, staff uh, with the Ministry of Environment to consult widely. Um, through a thorough cons consultation with the public, with stakeholders, with Indigenous communities, municipalities and others. And through this consultation, Speaker, ministry officials are they're able to identify and find solutions for uh, any potential negative effects of proposals yes, before decisions are made. So, Speaker, we remain very committed to working with municipalities and communities to ensure that all projects are protective of both the environment and public health. Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, uh, the community of Attawapiskat on the James Bay, like many other communities that are without road, had their electricity generated for years by way of diesel generators. Unfortunately, in Attawapiskat, like other communities, but in this case, Attawapiskat, there was a major diesel spill over a period of years that contaminated ground underneath what is now the daycare centre, what is now the hospital, what is now the ambulance garage, nurses' residence, and other buildings in around the vast site, vast site being where the tanks used to be. There was an allocation made by your ministry to clean this up of about $1.6 million. Ministry of Energy was the other ones because Hydro One had to pay part of the bill. But when we cleaned the spill at the hospital because of another spill, we utilized that money to pay for it. My question to you is, have we made a new reallocation of funds in order to get this project question. back on track and clean up the vast site? Minister of Health, Health and Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question. And I'm not familiar with the particular circumstances of this uh, uh, particular event that happened at some point in the past. Um, I will certainly commit to the member that I will look into it in, in more depth. But I would like to say, Mr. Speaker, that our government is absolutely committed uh, to the health of our First Nations communities. And I think we've demonstrated uh, this type of commitment with uh, the 
signature last year, the former Minister of Health uh, made uh, an agreement with the Anishinaabe Aski Nation and Health Canada, outlining a path to transforming the health care system for our First Nations. Uh, this is a health care facility. I certainly will look into the circumstances uh, and uh, provide the member with uh, a further response Great in the answer. near future. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. But to be clear, Minister, your ministry had made the allocation, so the responsibility has already been accepted by MOH because much of where the spill is happens to be on MOH property under Waha, which is the hospital. So the community is concerned. When I was there the other day meeting with them, they were concerned that everything is sort of grounded to a halt after we utilize that money to clean the spill that happened later on under the, under the Waha Hospital in Attawapiskat. So what we need is a commitment to make sure that the dollars that are supposed to be allocated for the cleanup, which were in five years ago worth about 1.6, so it'll obviously be more than that today, is reallocated so that the community can do the cleanup and make sure that kids in daycare centers, nurses and nursing residents, ambulance attendants and ambulances, and people in the hospital are Question. not at any risk and the community is cleaned up. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I've said, uh, I certainly uh, will look into the situation and get back to the member. But uh, I think it is a good opportunity to talk to some of our uh, recently announced new initiatives. Uh, we are providing funding directly to each of the 133 First Nations communities in Ontario to strengthen access to culturally appropriate home and community care services. And in this case, if there is some interruption, obviously we wish those uh, uh, vital services to be continued. And we are creating 16 new or expanded Indigenous govern and uh, community-driven interprofessional primary care teams across Ontario, providing culturally safe primary health care services and programs to some over 70,000 Indigenous peoples. I visited some fly-in communities myself. I understand the issues uh, on the ground. I will certainly look into this particular situation. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education Skills Development. Speaker, as you'll appreciate, Ontario's economy is growing. Well-paying jobs are being created daily. We lead the G7 in economic growth, and as you'll know, we have the lowest unemployment rate in two decades. And of course, Speaker, that kind of economic growth will be accompanied by demographic growth in many of our communities. And by the way, I'd like to thank the minister for uh, presenting herself at West Humber Collegiate in Etobicoke North for a recent educational announcement. Speaker, Brampton is one such vibrant city, the second fastest growing community in Canada, youth population expected to grow by 20% by 2035. Much to offer in the city of Brampton, like strong economy, stable marketplace, growing transit system, and of course, an inclusive community spirit. Speaker, I'd like to ask the minister, could she explain and detail more of the access to education initiatives that her ministry is uh, executing for young people? Thank you, Minister of Advanced Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the very dedicated and hardworking member of Etobicoke North for this question. Mr. Speaker, we know that um, we have great uh, communities and a great education system. We have a classroom of students here today, and it's important that we give them hope for the future. Our government recognized that Brampton is a city that uh, is really, at the heart, a great city. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, that with the leadership of our Premier, we made a commitment to the people of Peel Region. We promised that we would build a university campus. We asked universities and colleges in Ontario to partner so that they could bring this vision to Brampton. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand in this House today to say that we have delivered on this commitment. Yeah. Last week, the member from Brampton West, the member from Mississauga Brampton South, the member from Brampton Springdale and I were pleased Answer. to announce that Ryerson University together with Sheridan College, will develop a, a campus that is focused on the people of Brampton. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I, of course, I'm sh completely aware of how the people in Peel are thrilled by this new announcement, courtesy of uh, Ryerson and Sheridan. And, of course, uh, folks in Brampton want to stay in their community. They've been calling for a local option for education, and our government has delivered. 
And Speaker, I want to again salute the Minister for initiatives and education in this knowledge-based economy and the government broadly, whether we're talking about full-day kindergarten, teaching, computer coding in, pri in, uh, in grade school, increased graduation rates, or by the way, the 235,000 young folks and others who are now availing themselves of the free tuition for two- and four-year college and university. My question, Speaker, is this. Would the minister please outline more details about this educational investment in Peel Region? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Etobicoke North. And uh, I want to thank all of the, our caucus members from the Brampton and Peel region for championing this initiative. Speaker, our government is ensuring that Brampton continues on its path to innovation because Brampton is in the middle of Canada's innovation super corridor. We want people to learn, be trained, and to stay in their communities. And with our programs like free tuition that we're offering through the new OSAP, we're making college and universities more accessible to more families. Our focus is to create a talent pipeline in this community for science, technology, engineering and arts, as well as mathematics for students, enhancing an already talented and innovative region through a focus on STEAM. That is why, Speaker, our government announced an investment of $90 million to support this opportunity for the people of Brampton. And, Speaker, tens of thousands of Answer. smart companies are already doing business in the region. By building this campus, businesses will have a steady supply of current students. Thank you. Your question to the member from Lanark for Athletics and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. To the Attorney General. The Attorney General is charged with providing advice to the Cabinet and protecting the integrity of the Crown. In the past few weeks, the Premier has been campaigning on the public dime. At last count, it was 39 different events across the province, and for that, the Premier is under investigation. Will the Attorney General advise Cabinet and the Premier to end this pernicious practice of part campaigning on the, on the taxpayer's dime? Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker. First of all, I will just highlight to the member op opposite, Premier is under no investigation whatsoever. Uh, the members opposite has, have filed a, uh, a spurious uh, complaint uh, to Elections Ontario. Elections Ontario, of course, looks at all matters that are uh, that are uh, brought forward towards them, and they they issue a, a template response as they have done so in this particular in instance. But, Speaker, I am just uh, uh, I'm just uh, uh, you know continue to notice how the members opposite the Doug Ford team does not want the premier to talk about the plan for care and opportunity, her plan to build Ontario up her plan to create opportunity for hard-working Ontarians, a plan that will ensure that we, we expand OHIP Plus from children that are up to 25 years old all the, uh, to, us, uh, to our seniors that are 65 and older, a plan that will ensure that we increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour starting Sir. January 1, 2019, a plan that is going to build more long-term care beds and put much-needed investment in our health care system. You. Supplementary. To the Attorney General, the writing is on the wall for this tired, uncaring and scandalous government, and a line-by-line -line audit will expose in detail the many suspected sketchy practices. But the Premier continues to bend the rules and uses taxpayer money to campaign across the province. Will the Attorney General advise and instruct all of Cabinet not to delete emails or shred important documents that would obstruct or frustrate the Chief Electoral Officer's investigation into these pernicious practices. Thank you. Attorney General. Speaker, the people of Ontario wants to know what is Doug Ford is hiding. Why does he does not want the media to, to follow him and to make sure that they get to ask him the important questions? Why, 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 does he, why doesn't he answer questions to the media when posed to him? Because, Speaker, Doug Ford has an agenda of Cuts, cuts, and cuts. That's it. Wrap up sentence, please. Doug Ford wants to cut taxes for large, wealthy businesses. Doug Ford will cut minimum wage for hardworking people. Doug Ford will cut services like health and education. He wants to just cut, cut, and cut, Speaker. Thank you. The, uh, <coughs> It's never too late. 
the member from Lanark, Fronick, Lennox, and Addington is warned. The Minister of Infrastructure is warned. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. And that carries over to this afternoon. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 31, an act to implement budget measures into an act and amend various statutes. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. I wouldn't ask that if I were you. <laughs> on, on, on April 10, 2018, Mr. Souza moved second reading of Bill 31, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mrs. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mr. Verniel. Mrs. Verniel. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Ms. Uh, Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please rise. One more time. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller, Paris, San Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Paris, San Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Vanthoff. Mr. Vanthoff. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Schumanta. Ms. Schumanta. Mrs. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Uh, Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 49, the nays are 38. <laughs> the ayes being 49, the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, vision next year, the purge of the law. Pursuant to the order of the House dated April 23, 2018, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.